So, um, I don't have much of a voice today. I don't, know if, um, don't know how long I'll last. So, um, on page 52, I don't know how far we got last time, but let's jump in there. So there are the preliminaries. And when you read, when you read about the preliminaries in Deity Yoga, you know, with, were you struck by the number of times that uh, complexes or whatever were removed from articles of offering? You know, if you're going to wash yourself with abrasive dirt, you, you know, you, you expel these forces out of whatever you're going to use. The suggestion to me is that we populate, in ordinary life, we populate everything we deal with, with this sort of crud. And since we're not cleaning it up, that's what we're faced with. I don't know what else it could mean. Okay, and then, um, the protection of the place is done <clears throat> in a very complex manner. You would think any one of them might be enough. At the top of page 54, the obstructors are, you know, fumigated, they're bound, you put a fence up, you put a lattice over the fence, you know, and you've got a canopy over that, and you've got Flames over that, and <clears throat> so is space is being created in which effective meditation can take place. Then, concentration with repetition. The first phase of the concentration with repetition is the meditative stabilization of exalted body, right? In what sense does that meditative stabilization of exalted body involve repetition? Why is it called concentration with repetition? Prepares you for repetition. Okay. When is that repetition done? In the next phase. Which is called? Concentration of exalted sound. Of exalted of speech. speech. Um, during the course of the concentration of exalted, no, sorry, the meditative stabilization of exalted speech, is, is there just concentration with repetition? Is that all that's going on? Mm -hmm. uh, or is there also concentration without repetition? Yes. There's overlapping terms here. So within the concentration, within with repetition, we have the meditative stabilization of exalted body, right? Now, you would think that the meditative stabilization of exalted speech would be put here, and contained within repetition. But is it? Nothing. You said it isn't. What isn't? What part of the meditative stabilization of exalted speech is not included within the concentration with repetition? The, I, I'm confused on the question. 
uh, meditative stabilization of exalted speech. Right. Is it okay if we write it here? Uh, and include it within the concentration uh, with repetition? Actually, there, there were those four steps, the, the four branches mm -hmm. of concentration with repetition. Um, it sounded like, and this, I, I was actually confused when I wanted to ask mm. about this. It sounds like number one and two go with exalted body. Okay. When numbers one and two it's are called... Other base and self base. Then? Then comes ex exalted speech, which is the moon and the sound, or the mind and the sound. But the problem I had was that on page 27, you have these four outlined again, other base, self base, mind, and sound, and you say these four are included within the meditative stabilization of the exalted body. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a little... I'm contradicting my own presentation today. <laughs> right at the bottom. Yeah, it's wrong. That is wrong? Okay. <laughs> so the first two are then body and the second two are speech. Is that mm -hmm. it? Okay. I'm 27. Well, oh. <laughs> you can fudge it. You can fudge it either way. If you, I, I think, generally speaking, this is the better way of doing it, dividing them up. But if you said that uh, you do meditative stabilization of body, and then in a transitional phase, you imagine the moon, and with the letters set around it, sound then refers to the letters set around it. And then the repetition takes place. Right. But a it, it's smoother way of doing it is indeed to put moon in sound here. Because I guess what's also confusing is then you have the other moon within self of, what is it, the form? The fourth deity. Yeah, you know, there you have another moon with letters around it. It gets very. Gets very hairy, doesn't it? So, I'll. In what you read for today, I want to draw this out of you. You can draw things out of me too, as you just did. subdivisions of the concentration without repetition. W was that assigned for no, today? No, That's no, next no, time? That wasn't assigned for today. Okay. So for next time, figure out where the three subdivisions of the concentration without repetition go. Do they go with the meditative Stabilization of exalted body, or the meditative stabilization of exalted speech, or the meditative stabilization of exalted mind, or more than one. Okay. If you if if you get this vocabulary straight, you'll get a lot straight, and we'll leave it. Leave the mystery. Oh, I'm under the weather.
Yes. I'm wondering, um, in this uh, level of Kriya Yoga, are these three stages of meditative stabilization uh, sequential? Yes. Definitely sequential. Yes. Takes care of that question. <laughs> So, uh, nobody has caught me yet on the mistake I made earlier, in which I said that the concentration continuation tantra, some people hold, is a continuation of what tantra? What did I say before? And what actually turns out to be the case, as, it is, as is said on page 55, no one caught me. Okay. Many people took notes that day when I wrote on the blackboard right over there that the concentration continuation tantra, from one point of view, is said to be a continuation of the Vajra Vidarana Tantra. Wrong. The Vajroshnisha Tantra, as is said here correctly on page 55. And from what other point of view is it called the concentration continuation tantra? You see, that kind of continuation is like an appendix, a supplement to the Vajrosh Nisha Tantra. Um, yes? And what if I mean about a Tantra? Do you mean like a natural like, process or like just one practice? Is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about like a text or what? In this case here, I'm talking about a text. Uh, but the basic meaning of Tantra, as is laid out in one of the highest yoga Tantras, is that it means continuum. So it's interesting that you use the word process. Uh, it means continuum. The Tibetan word is Du. And the Tantra says, Du ni, Du she jiao cha. You need yun. What does you mean? It means yun. Which <laughs> is just a slight difference in the spelling in Tibet. And you and yun uh, have very similar meaning in Tibet. So uh, you we often translate as continuum, and yun we translate as continuum or stream. And Continuum is looked at in three ways. The basis, which is in the highest yoga tantra, the fundamental innate mind of clear light. And the path, which purifies that fundamental innate mind of clear light of adventitious defilements. And then the fruit continuum. So you see there's a path process and a fruit or resultant process, which are the uh, pure body, probably body and mind of a Buddha. And then the texts that set these forth are called tantras. These four? that set these forth, that set forth these topics. <laughs> so in one way, um, the Concentration Continuation Tantra is like an extra chapter of the Vajrosh Nisha Tantra. In another way, it's a separate Tantra that goes on and lays out further concentrations. Okay. It's interesting, though, that you have uh, in this four branch, you have the bases, and then you have mind and sound. Do you think that it would be flipped the other way, sound and then mind, to as in subtler levels, body, mind, and sound, body, sound, and mind. The. Uh, moon stand is the platform for the letters that stand on it. Thus, base comes before mind, I mean, before sound. Right. 
That's the only reason. That's the only reason. Yeah. And so as you, again, we have another possible confusion right. that the term mind is used for something within the meditative stabilization of exalted speech. OK? Right. Yes? What is meant by concentration with repetition? What's the repetition? as opposed to without repetition. Yes, one wonders. Uh, <laughs> because when you're meditating on the deity in front, although you might repeat some mantras when you make offerings, that's not this repetition that's being referred to. I'm going to answer your question negatively first. Uh, and then the main part of the uh, meditative stabilization of exalted body is to concentrate on your own body in divine form, not to be reciting mantra. And even if you do recite mantra for the sake of resting, you get real tired, and, but you don't want to leave the session, you want to juice yourself up a little bit, that is not this repetition. The repetition comes only when you have completed all four branches and you're imagining eventually a, a uh, flat moon disc at your own heart and the letters set up around it and you begin reciting mantra. That's when the repetition comes. That's when the repetition comes. So now then the question comes, why is the meditative stabilization of body included within the concentration with repetition? Because it serves it sets up the basis for the repetition. OK, OK. You know, if that's the way you want to do it, OK. You know, you can see terminology in India, probably different strands of uh, systems of yoga and the coming into one practice. And so the terms won't exactly fit. But then you, if you're clever, you make them. That's part of the, the aesthetic of putting together a system. And it's really, they take great joy in uh, making things fit. You know, there's no repetition, but we call it with repetition because it's the basis of repetition, right? Yeah. And then is without repetition because, isn't that yeah. meant to calm abiding for <clears throat> Go ahead. I said, well, is, is the without? Repetition is what's supposed to lead to common violence, actually. Um, yes. There's, so we'll answer this question. Uh, this one is called Mene, Abiding in Fire. This is called Abiding, of course, in Sound. Now, these two parts of the concentration without repetition are still within the meditative stabilization of exalted speech. Hear me? Mm -hmm. Without repetition, but included within speech. Now, we're going to have to, the aesthetic to describe these is going to have to be considerable, is it not? And the reason is that in the earlier part of the meditative, the meditative stabilization of exalted speech, you are either voicing mantra, or you are whispering mantra, or you are as if reciting mantra yourself. Whereas in these two phases, mantra is still there, but it's within fire, uh, and it's as if and in, in, in the case of sound, within a more subtle fire, but it's as if somebody else is reciting it. And that's why these are called concentrations without repetition, because it's without your own repetition. In that? Yes. In that practice, did they ever use the word, the word nian, that there's a sense that you are you're not reciting yes. you are listening to the recipe. I think it's tub. Yeah. We can get out the actual. And then the last one is the meditative stabilization 
bestowing liberation at the end of sound. And that teams up with the meditative stabilization of exalted mind. So you wouldn't, you'd probably, um, We'll figure out how you draw the chart, OK? Uh, this way of drawing the chart is not very good, is it? Because we have beneath everything that is within the concentration with repetition, correct? Should be concentration within rep concentration with repetition. Well, it's not. Because not all of meditative stabilization is exalted speech is included within that. So figure out how to do a chart. So that, so that things will fit, and you can use braces on the outside and so forth. It does fit. It's not, it's not totally counter, counterintuitive or, or um, what do you say, self-contradictory, paradoxical. It seems easy if we just get, go away with the, or get rid of the terms with repetition without repetition, just go into the three. <laughs> but, <no. laughs> I mean, it would really, it yes. seems to. But the value of with repetition and without repetition is I think when you get down to this stage, you notice then, you really notice that this is not your own repetition. That something that still has mantra is called without repetition gets through strongly the point that, that uh, it's not your own repetition. You're listening to someone else's, even if it's at the very center of your heart. Yes. I'm trying to, I, I can't place just where I read this, but it seems to me there's four levels of repetition, that being out loud, sort of um, uh, semi-vocalized or mumbling, uh, whispering, and then in a silent mode of repetition. Uh, I don't know of four types. I suppose you could have a ferocious repetition, and then a voiced one, and then whispered, and then mental. But in general, it said voiced, whispered, and mental. And the advice is to do the voiced first, then whispered, then mental, even if you can do the mental first in order to get the sense of sound. Um, but we need to be very clear here uh, at particular stages what's being done. So let's go through it. Yes. As far as the relationship between these two goes, I'm, I'm just trying to clarify something. Are you saying that even though the, medita the meditative stabilization of the mind is under the rubric of concentration with repetition, that it cannot actually be arrived at without first going through concentration without repetition? Is that what I, is what I thought I heard? I'm not sure. Uh, no. Um, you're right on the latter part of it, but the meditative stabilization of exalted speech is not included within concentration with repetition. It's not. Part of it is and part of it isn't. And how about exalted mind? So you see, I'm saying the chart is misdrawn up here as far as in and out goes, and I'm asking you to, to draw me a chart. Yes? And how about exalted mind? Exalted mind, of course, is not included within okay. that. Okay. Yeah. That's so there are... What within meditative stabilization of exalted speech is not included in concentration without repetition? It's these two. It's these three over here. So, no, no, no. Sorry, it's these two. Abiding in fire and abiding in sound. So you can easily figure out how to draw the chart. So, next time, would you hand in a, such a chart? Bring a chart. Because you'll have read the last chapter and you'll know where everything fits. I'm being Sorry, I don't humorous, really understand the, the connection, the meditative stabilization of the mind, the connection with the destroying liberation at the end. What's really going, what do you, are you They're doing, equal. They're, okay. So there's no more repetition at all because they kind of cancel each Right, neither. Yeah. 
there's no more repetition either as if you're voicing it or as if somebody else is voicing it. I hope. I hope we won't undo that. You know, you're going to be reading about that tomorrow, and let's put that forth as a thesis and see if I'm right. These things so much, you know, unless you've read them in the last few days. They, mm -hmm. hmm. Anything else? So the deity in front, you first imagine a residence, and then you imagine the resident. You invite the deity, page 58. Uh, I may, you know, deal with your questions briefly today. Don't let me put you off. I'm, you know, it's like my mind is somewhere back on this cold. Just stop me. Displaying hand gestures. Anything you want to talk about there? Offerings? And then, you know, when somebody comes to your house, you know, you offer them something when they come in, and bottom of page 60, you praise them, and you say, oh, that's such a beautiful tie you're wearing. Oh, what a lovely blouse. <laughs> you know, all those things. And you offer them a little, oh, wouldn't you like a drink? And yeah, this is just what you're doing here. It's no different. But then you do worship. One yes. thing, seal is not something you, you would do, though, in a normal situation. So the notion of seal, I'm not really clear on that. The uh, invitation of. Uh, in, in this context, the seal that guarantees it, a promise. Oh, 58. Inviting the deity. Where? Seal of invitation. Where? Oh, uh, fourth paragraph down, just before the quote, above that quote. Seal. Seal of invitation. Um, you know, people used to put wax down and you put your seal into it, and that means Jeffrey Hopkins is going to pay you back because my seal is there. Right. And just so these various signs uh, seal an activity, seal, they symbolize a certain thing. That it's, that it's done, or? Yes, that it's done. Like I can't take goodbye. it any farther than that, though. Yeah. I know what you're pressing on. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. There's a level of dissatisfaction. In Yoga Tantra, the seals must be done. In the other Tantras, the seals, it's your, you can do them or not do them. But in Yoga Tantra, they're particularly important. Mudra. Mm. So, 60, offering things that you would offer in a hot country, I guess, lamps and turn on the lights in the living room, put some music on something pleasant to smell in the air, right? We do most of these things. Flowers, as one Tibetan says to, said to me about uh, topless bars, oh, that, that's like in Tantra. <laughs> <laughs> food, you lay out some food. <coughs> Clothing is we don't lay out clothing, do we? We don't give a foot bath either. Foot bath, no. 
hope we do have the expression to give someone the shirt off your back. I mean, if mm. it, it, it shows a different level of intimacy, it might not be a formal guest, but if it's family or close yes. friend, and the weather is cold, and they have not prepared adequately, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Praising, worship. Worship, which includes uh, confession. The word for confession really being disclosure, not hiding. Not hiding what you've done. Said if you hide what you've done, its force grows in your own mind. So the value of disclosure is to prevent that growth. <laughs> When you think it's just what you offer, do you have the intention of like multiplying? Oh, yes. And being as pure, and even if you don't offer that, like you see flowers, you can offer them even without cutting them mm. in the altar. Is that part of this? Or? Yes, definitely. Anything seen could be offered. <sighs> So you see, these phases, would these practices <coughs> disclosure, or on page 62, refuge, <coughs> altruism, admiration of one's own and others' virtues, apparent. It said it's all right to admire your own virtues. Wrong to be proud of them, but fine to admire them. Take joy in them. I can feel the difference in those words in English. When you take pride in something, it's as if you've done enough. It said it's like a piece of iron, a lump of iron. Nothing new can be put inside it. But ad admiration is like, you know, when you admire what you've done, it means, oh, I've got to do more of that. Interesting. So then in treaty, asking for more teaching and s supplicating the teachers to remain. And then prayer wishes, making wishes. Wishes is a form of meditation. Then there's a cultivation of altruism, page 63. And there are these great stanzas at the bottom of 64. For anybody who thinks that in t that Tantra is a corruption of the practices of sutra. We can at least say that the Susidhi Tantra is not. Great lines. One does these in front of a deity. Interesting, isn't it? Imagine a deity in front of yourself and then generate altruism. Then on the bottom of page 65, Concentration Continuation Tantra speaks about self base and somewhat obtuse language, but then it's all very clear. May I ask a question on 66? Please. Um, I was a little confused in the first paragraph when you're, when you're saying not discriminated by others and devoid of discrimination, what exactly um, that, that refers to. Yeah. The bottom of page 65, the Tantra says about suchness, emptiness, the final mode of being of things, 
says something like it's beyond discrimination. Well, wisdom is supposed to be discrimination. And it's supposed to be wisdom that realizes this. And so either you've got a case where the, the Tantra isn't agreeing with this particular view on wisdom, and so Tsongba and his followers have to take the Tantra and twist it into meaning what they want, OK? Throw an interpretation on it, contrary to what the Tantra seems to be saying. Or the Tantra itself is saying something that accords with wisdom's being discrimination. Now, when you look, as I was reading it today, I thought, oh my, that explanation isn't very good. <laughs> it says on line five, also one's own suchness, one's own emptiness of inherent existence, being formless, OK, is not apprehended by others. Well, you could apprehend my final nature, could you not? It doesn't have to, some, you could meditate on, I could meditate on your emptiness of inherent existence, couldn't I? Just you as with, yeah, okay. So, it seems, this does come from Buddha Goya, uh, that form, he's just trying to make the point that it's formless. All right, so far. But it's not apprehended by others, and thus is not discriminated by others. I thought we were shifting there to a kind of conventional. You know, the others aren't participating in it. It's yoga. But other people could realize it. And it itself does not apprehend forms and so forth. That's OK. Mm -hmm. And thus is thoroughly devoid of discrimination. <coughs> oh, but it does. If we speak not just about suchness, but about the mind realizing suchness, it doesn't apprehend forms. But it does apprehend suchness with discrimination. But in order to explain somehow that this mind is devoid of discrimination. He has to say it is because um, it doesn't apprehend forms. Well, give me a break, you know. I mean, uh, I sense somebody who's twisting the text to, to make it conform to his own system. But I mean, the deity who is the deity which is merged with emptiness, mm -hmm. the that is emptiness, I mean, you're still picturing it as a form, even though that form is merged with emptiness. No, at, that, at the point of the ultimate deity, anyway, you're, there's no form. No form at all is appearing. But later on to the. Later on, yes. With yeah. Sign, yeah. Guess, you know. yeah. Here, you, we're talking about the ultimate deity. Oh, okay. So what's uh, that? It's not discriminated. I thought it was like the different suchnesses of, of the suchness of the day. Well, you see, he's got his own way of doing it, too. Well, I, I thought. I was just to make it fit his system. <laughs> trying to understand him. That's what I thought he was. Yeah, it's hard to figure out. It's like it's, it's beyond discrimination. It seems to be what it's saying, right? <laughs> it's just, it's far out. It sounds like you were saying that, that your defense of this was that there is no clear distinction being made in this case between the content of the mind's realization of emptiness and the mind. That what's without discrimination is the content. Well, that's not my problem with it. Uh, my problem with it is that it seems to be saying that realization, yeah, I, I think the two are being mixed, the content, emptiness, and the mind realizing. That's fine. That's typical. Uh, but it, the line is making the frequently made point that the ultimate is beyond all thought. Whereas in Tsongkhapa's system, the ultimate is subject to thought and is revealed by thought. 
although direct realization of emptiness cannot be captured by thought exactly as it is, you know, uh, you get to it through using discrimination. So I'm getting confused because I'm not seeing a problem in that. I mean, I, I see a problem if you say that thought is discrimination. But if you can regard a thought of suchness, when you think about suchness, you don't think about this suchness and that suchness. There's a suchness. Mm. So in that sense, there's no discrimination. That's what he's saying. Yes. And it doesn't that, so it, it it's could because be. suchness being an ultimate truth, or whatever you want to call it, and therefore it is not broken up. Mm. It so could that, be. Does that mean? It could be. It's just we're left with this very, and you see, in now in your two ways of handling the stanza, and especially because you're seeing the suchness of yourself and the deity as the same, there without discrimination, right? right? But Buddha Guya ties doesn't do it your way. He ties is not discriminated to its being formless and thus it's not known by others. He's not. He's maybe not doing as good a job as you are. Really. And that often happens uh, where the Tibetan scholars who are pretending only to be following what the Indians are saying are quite often doing a better job. And they know they're doing a better job. But they pretend, well, I'm just but here, Tsongaba isn't making it, he isn't himself intruding. He's trying to give Buddha Guya's run on it. Is there somewhere in particular in the things that you translated, I'd like to look at this, look at this more deeply, this Tsongaba's view of the relationship between thought and the ultimate? Um, in the book, entitled Compassion in Tibetan Buddhism, the chapter from his commentary on Chandrakirti's Madhyamakavatara entitled The Inexpressible Trail, which is about the fact that when a bird passes through the sky, there are no tracks left. And thus you can't say, oh yeah, there are the tracks. And so it is with direct realization of emptiness. You cannot express it exactly as it is experienced. But then he goes on to say, you can express it, though. There may be something there. It may be a very short thing. So mental analysis, you see, unmoving and clear the last line, mental analysis remains in its presence. The text itself speaks about analysis. Which is the problem. Yeah. So then what is it? But non discrimination. Right. There was thought and there's no thought. Yeah. You got it. Hmm? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what's the difference between mental analysis and discrimination? Uh, well, mental analysis, I'll give you. A mental analysis here um, refers to searching with the Madhyamaka reasoning for the inherent existence of the object and not finding that kind of analysis. Devoid, uh, not discriminated, as Buddha Goya says, means that since suchness is formless, it's not apprehended by others. That, that's simply what it means. It doesn't have any wider meaning than that. You're to narrow its meaning greatly. And when you say suchness is thoroughly devoid of discrimination, it's because it, it doesn't discriminate other things.
So analysis can take place without any discriminative effort. No, 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 impossible. So that's why we have to narrow very sharply what the term discrimination means, because analysis does mean that discrimination is taking place, intense discrimination. But if he says it's unmoving and clear, then that would indicate it's non-directed and non-defined. No. Why? Non-moving means it's steady. Clear means it's, it's uh, bright on both the object side and subject side. <clears throat> Did you read this? Yeah. Oh. Clear means, <laughs> clear means, it says unmoving, means endowed with stability, free from excitement. Clear, that is to say, free from laxity. See, these are the two extremes of the ordinary mind, excitement and laxity. And so unmoving and clear indicates that the analysis is at, is at a level where one is free from the two impediments to calm abiding, these being uh, excitement and laxity, being too loose and being too tight and being too loose. So you actually do this analysis when you're with ultimate deity. Now this is this is very good. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, this is what eventually, it's going to turn out that the real analysis will be done at the time of meditative stabilization of exalted mind. Because that'll be when the mind is unmoving and clear. Because you will have achieved calm abiding, as she said, uh, at the time, at the end of the meditative stabilization of exalted speech. But you do something like this at the point of the ultimate deity. Just because you don't do the full-blooded thing doesn't mean that you don't do something. Are Good you doing point. it also with the speech? The whole yes, thing throughout the whole the thing. Ultimate. But the real emphasis on emptiness meditation comes with the last meditative stabilization. Yeah. Then the vocabulary of concentration and meditative stabilization comes in in a different context, not these. Uh, but to refer to, and this is the bottom of page 67, last paragraph, concentration is meditation which involves many aspects. Six deities or the specifics of the divine body, the color and what the eye looks like and so forth. And don't ask me why they, this is called jhana or concentration. There's some tradition that fed into this practice so that this was called concentration. It doesn't mean concentration with and without repetition. Then the term meditative stabilization is used, and you can see why, when you're fixating on something that has become, you know, your main object whether this be the general divine body or some part of the divine body, say the head. You can see a, an incredible confluence <coughs> of traditions within this one tradition. You know, otherwise, who could dream it up this way? And it doesn't, I mean, it's such a, this doesn't even specify which deity it has to be. It could, for each deity, the Oh, yes. Concentration and stabilization would be very different because yes. of the quality of the deed. Then, page 68. Having set oneself thus, meditate with the mantra minds. Mantra minds are the six deities. Restrain, dwell in meditative stabilization. So meditate means to meditate with concentration, this being examining the various aspects. Then dwell in meditative stabilization. Restraining vitality and exertion. This is a very common term in India, pranayama.
which strangely came into Tibetan, or it seems strange at least on the surface, as a life exertion. Life, I translate as vitality, okay? Vitality basically means breath, but all sorts of other winds. These are the winds, not only the entering and out of the mouth and nose, but also the hair pores, the other senses, um, sexual organs, whatever, you know, the holes in the body. And once you count all the hair pores, that's like everywhere in the body. And the, <coughs> you know, if you think of it as energy, that exits, you know, if you decide you're going to look over there, there's some energy that moves there, and then you look there, sometimes. Energy goes first, and then you look. Or you're looking, and then suddenly the energy goes there. And so there's this energy that is moving out through the sense senses. And the process of meditation is to pull back that, pull back the energy. He uses the example of the turtle pulling, what is it? Retracting. Huh? Retracting. And then retracting limbs, head also. And what else? Sucking in. Water with your tongue. Mm. So now, breath then comes to have this wider meaning. This, yes? Does that mean consciousness, since it rises in the beginning, was thought to go? Consciousness, yeah, is said to ride on, on the wind. This breath is like the mount of the horse but that consciousness that rides on. There's what? Consciousness coming up. Well, it's very interesting to think about it that way. Or is it only the Oh no, it's out. And especially what they're seeking to do here is to, to withdraw it. So usually Pranayama and and the, the text here says some weird things. But Ayama. I believe this is what it comes from. I believe, <coughs> as I remember, yam means stop in Sanskrit. And ayama has somehow come, ends up as being derived from a verbal root in Sanskrit meaning stop. I haven't, looked, I haven't looked into this, which is obvious. So pranayama is taken as usually as meaning stopping breath. Which in Tibetan, once you take life, prana as life, would be salt. You know, gakba or gokba or something like that. Salt gakba, salt gokba. But they did not translate it that way. Rather, they took some word, ayama, and I, uh, back. Two, two weeks or so ago, when I thought I'd be talking about this, I looked it up in, a, uh, in one of the cross-reference books and found a word for exertion in Tibetan that in Sanskrit was ayaman or something like that. But by now, when I do have to talk about it, I've forgotten it. Uh, is exertion. And exertion here is taken as meaning mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is usually a good thing, but here it's taken as mindfulness, distracted mindfulness. So it means distraction. So even in this etymology of the famous term pranayama, it means stopping. You add a word that means stopping. Stopping, breath, and distraction. And you have to know in each context of when it's used, which meaning is appropriate. And for Tibetanists, 
the fact that it comes in as so so is quite troublesome because the translation is always the same. Once they got the equivalent, they just use one equivalent, which is understandable. But you, you have here that you have as mindfulness, not ayama. Uh, that's why I was saying the there's something askew between what's in here and what the actual fact is, and I don't know which the actual fact is here. Okay. In other words, circle it and put question marks all over it. Because there's another text that this Vairochanabhi Sambodhi does it out as Yama, which is strange. Because then you have a problem with Sambi, don't you? Oh, you have a problem with the A. Uh. Right. Yeah. Is it A uh, Yama or A uh, Yama? Or? Prana, Prana. It's, it's Prana. There's right, no question right. about that. Right. Because I was saying if you take just Yama, then you have the problem with the A of the, the, of the last A of prana. Yes. It's short. But you can always rely on a rule like exceptions are allowed. <laughs> right. <laughs> My guess is that the, the stopping etymology is on yama, and the, uh, m the mindfulness or exertion <coughs> one is ayama, actually. That's my guest today. Oh, sorry to be so worn out. Then. For those who you studied the process of combining, uh, this section, of course, is uh, very clear. And for those of you who haven't, which is probably most of you, the section is probably made obtuse by the fact that so much is going on within three or four pages, isn't it? I mean, you're going from a totally distracted mind to a mind of, of meditative equipoise, of calm abiding, full of uh, the suppleness of the in various pliancies and the bliss of mental and physical pliancy within three or four pages. Now the point of the discussion is that the techniques of action tantra that appear in the meditative stabilization of speech cannot be appreciated unless you understand the process of developing calm body. You simply can't be appreciated. You understand why they're doing them. You understand um, how the techniques would help. So the basic problems that human beings have, on page 72, with meditating, the biggest one at the beginning is laziness. Laziness we usually think of, in, uh, of as indolence, attachment to sleeping, and procrastination, putting it off till tomorrow. But it's also thinking, how could a jerk like me achieve meditative stabilization? You know? That you don't take on the task. And among the, see there are five faults and eight antidotes. And from among the eight antidotes, four of them, isn't it, are for counteracting laziness. That's why that's laziness is so important. But pliancy, the last one, really comes when you've developed meditative stabilization. It, of course, is the supreme antidote to laziness. But you couldn't have that beforehand. But you could reflect on the value of, of pliancy. So faith means to be captivated with the good qualities. You know, oh, wow, I'd really like to have meditation. Did I get really hard to stay in the object? And you know, it'd be really nice to have a mind like that. I wouldn't be sinking down. 
You know who isn't thinking then, today? It's even, what do you say? I'm down with my cold also. Mm. And then wishing to have those and then being convinced of them. So then to remember, next is to remember the object of meditation once you've gotten yourself meditating. And that's done through developing a capacity of mindfulness. It's not merely to use the mindfulness that you already have, but to develop a capacity for mindfulness by constantly re-putting the mind on the object. Oh, I've left the object. Oh, God, I've done it again. Here I, you know, what was I meditating on? And you know, sometimes you have to think for a few minutes, at least it seems like a few minutes, to, f to remember what you were meditating on, right? And you put your mind back on it, back on it, back on it, back on it, and gradually the mind becomes more capable of staying on it. So introspection at that point is, later there's an introspection which is inspecting to see, am I too tight or am I too loose? Is my mind too tight or too loose? At this point, however, an introspection is, am I on the object or am I not on the object? That's introspection. Mindfulness, then, is the capacity to stay on, which is then built up by putting your mind back on it, by not going with these various things that you think of. Then, when you are able to put your mind somewhat on the object of meditation, the big problems are laxity and excitement. Uh, apprehending the object either too tightly or too loosely. The greater danger, apparently, is that one would apprehend it, in general, too loosely. Thus it's said, if you wonder if you're apprehending it too loosely or too tightly, tighten. Make it more taut. And that there's a great danger of mistaking uh, what is still a loose state with proper meditative stabilization. You're able, eventually able with the fourth, you know, there are nine mental abidings. With the fourth one, you're able to stay in the object. But you can still have subtle laxity. Wow, I can really stay in the object now, no problem. And, but there's still a subtle laxity there. And the claim is that a lot of people mistake that subtle laxity for meditative stabilization. So, well, uh, you know, Maharishi and so forth used to talk about the alert mind, the alert mind. It's not a, a dull mind. You know, sometimes you sit in class, your mind becomes somewhat dull. I mean, you could examine your mind today. <laughs> Me too. Uh, and the mind is maybe not hopping all over the place, but even if it is staying on one thing, it's... <laughs> <laughs> so the antidote to laxing excitement is, so these are the poles, laxing excitement, either too loose or too tight. You're too loose, so you tighten it. And you start tightening it, you make it too tight. When it gets too tight, then the mind becomes fractured and you start to loosen, and you get to be too loose. And you, you, know, you move between these, applying the antidotes to uh, being too loose and too tight, and gradually learning how to tune the mind. And here, it lays out five levels of antidotes to looseness and five to tightness, starting with merely tightening it when you're too loose, just merely tightening it. You know how you, you can attempt in the middle of a lecture, you decide, well, oh, God damn it, I've been sitting here for an hour and I haven't heard much of anything, and now I am going to listen, you know? And within 30 seconds, you're not. <laughs> but you know, for the first 10 seconds, there's some sort of...
second part is turning the lights on. Hmm? And the second one's turning the lights on. Yeah, and then you go and you, you notice detail. I often do that. I'm in a faculty meeting or whatever and can't pay attention. I pay attention to the detail in the room. Start looking at detail. And that sharpens the mind. Of course, then I'm paying attention to the detail. <laughs> So then, the antidote to laxity and excitement in general uh, is introspection, noticing that you're lax or excited, noticing. And then you have to apply the antidotes. And then, of course, you can't keep applying the antidotes as I do in the faculty meeting. After my mind gets bright, I just keep looking at the details. I'm supposed to switch back to the to this <laughs> topics that are being discussed and uh, participate in the conversation. OK. So you can pay attention, for instance, if you're meditating the body of a Buddha, you can pay attention to the details so you can brighten the body. But if that doesn't work, then you've got to switch. You've got to switch out of the meditation. And, and imagine something else that you're used to, like uh, bestowing charity on, on a great many beings. And that'll vivify the mind. As soon as it's vivified, you put the mind back on the body of the Buddha. And if that doesn't work, then you have to leave the session. Well, there's one step here uh, for laxity, which was to imagine your mind is a white point of light and sending it out through the top of your head <laughs> and mixing with space. Isn't it that what they do also at the end? I mean, yes. That yes. It's sort of odd that they say that <laughs> yes. Islam was here. He, said, he says, no problem. Ah, oh, no problem. <laughs> Somebody took it too seriously, I would think. Yeah. So otherwise, then, if that doesn't work, you've got to leave the session. You take a cold shower, uh, you go to sleep, go to a high place, look off, look out in the distance. That's for too much looseness. For too much excitement, then you, you lower the object, make it a bit more dense, like the body of a Buddha, make it smaller, more dense. You can, um, what? If that doesn't work, then you meditate on something sobering, like impermanence. I had a birthday the other day. Meditate on impermanence. They said, give a speech. I said, impermanence. <laughs> That's all I said. What a party animal. What? I said, what a party animal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about impermanence and death, if you're used to it, it'll sober you right away. You know, you get excited from meditating, really excited, joyous, minds, like so. You think about impermanence and death. Oh, I'm going, it's going, to, it's just moment by moment, disintegrating, yeah. extremely quickly, and leading very quickly to death. All the time it's going in the past, it's like this. And now, all, you know, whatever I have left in my life, it's like this. If I spend it, you know, in distraction, it's a waste. And, it's amazing. It's like throwing cold water on water. <coughs> yes. Can you explain the difference between excitement and scattering? Excitement, the term, the Tibetan term, goba. Means wild. Uh, but it, it translates a technical term that means desirous excitement, not uh, enraged excitement. And nevertheless, it is used as an example for all types of scattering. All types of scattering are included here, whether it's desirous, hateful, or neutral. Neutral scattering would be like, oh, I, I forgot to sew the button on that shirt. You know, you try and meditate in the body of Buddha, you remember to sew the button on shirt. That's neutral scattering. Because it's not virtuous, it's not non-virtuous. But it's scattering is to be stopped. 
So this is a subtler form of the second fault of losing the object of meditation? Excitement is a subtler form of forgetting the object of meditation? This, this whole idea of scattering? Um, there are levels of laxity excitement. In the coarsest versions of laxity excitement, you lose the object. So that's closer to number two? Yes. Five. Correct. Okay. Laxing excitement do occur within number two. So, uh, for next time. In tantric techniques, and I will try to get myself better, uh, tantric techniques 86 to 97, correct? Dita Yoga 29 to 35, 155 to 179, 223 to 227, and please make a chart. I'm sorry, I missed that one. 223 to 227. This chart is a um, delineation of the um, Concentration with repetition and without repetition as related to the mental stabilities of body, speech, and mind? Yes. Is that what the chart And their subdivisions. And their subdivisions, though. Do you have a means to make a copy? Why don't I just use tape that I can have?